everyone. So here we are. We're back. Uh, the intent was for these lectures to be in person, uh, but at least the first week is going to be online. So this is ARC 3405, and the title of it, they get, ask us to pick our titles, is When Structure is Architecture. So to me, that is when uh, something is exposed, typically a feature element, when what you see is both the architecture and the structure simultaneously. Sometimes it's quite obvious, sometimes it's not always that obvious. Uh, in my experience, that in even large projects is where the architect's heart is. They get to play, they get to really uh, show off some things. Um, and that is the focal point of my company, Fat Lab, um, F-A-E-T-L-A-B, uh, that I started in 2014. And I started that because I noticed on large projects, for example, um, most of those things are excluded from a base building engineer's contract, simply because sometimes those things can be as expensive to design as the building because they're so focused, because they're so um, prioritized and prized by the architect and the owner and the public. It's There's not an obvious course of action to take for every single thing and nothing's ever the same. So it often ends up being um, uh, not part of the main contract. But owners and, and architects sometimes would push back. They didn't understand why it should be excluded. Um, one of the great things about my company existing is that engineers and architects too, because it really drives home that it's a special feature, uh, can typically get paid for some of these things now. Um, they can say, look, it is such, uh, it is so... Um, often excluded from the base contract. There are whole firms that exist around designing these things. So um, feedback I've gotten from other engineering firms in the city is that they're actually getting paid now uh, for these things that they always should have been paid, but usually they're getting kind of browbeat into uh, completing the design. But that also means that they're not giving it their whole heart. I know a project where it was like a week before tender and they wanted to know where the information for the stair was. And we weren't supposed to be doing the stair. Uh, and um, we did it and no one was happy. I wasn't happy because I couldn't focus on it and give it the attention it wanted. The architect wasn't happy because they didn't get what they had envisioned. And the owner wasn't happy because had they known they could have paid for a feature stair, they would have gotten a feature stair. Uh, so in some ways, all of these things can come together and really make uh, really make the high-profile items as high-profile as they deserve to be. Uh, what did I say in my slide? Uh, exploring the science behind structural elements that expose their structural form, architectural elements that expose their structural form. During this course, we will study the basic principles that dictate what we see as the vernacular of this broad range of objects. Uh, basically, most of these things are not obvious how to design. What's critical, what isn't, where do these loads come from? They're not the same as buildings, but we have to follow the building code. So how do you navigate that when there's not information for it in the building code? So what do you do? So as you know, I think all of you have taken my course. Almost every name looks familiar. Um, uh, Dave is going to be co-lecturing with me. Um, he used to teach and he loved it, but what he wasn't good at was the paperwork and the marking. Uh, but he really enjoys engaging with students and talking about these things. You will never find anyone more passionate about architecture engineering mashup than Dave Bowick. He's just truly truly fascinated by it so having access to him is going to be great uh we'll be <coughs> sorry uh we our intent is um for at least always one of us to be in the classroom during class time hopefully always giving lectures um uh this week we didn't well there was two reasons uh two reasons i'm gonna see if i can I'd have to loosen it. Um, 
Uh, the two reasons are is that they told me that there were going to be several students who didn't uh, qualify or who, who were going to get special exemptions because they couldn't be here in the city for the first week or two, possibly three. So they told us to allow ways to provide those people lectures. Since I was already set up to record lectures and my undergraduate class is being recorded, I thought that was a good way to solve it. My intent was to be there sitting in the classroom uh, so that people could come in, watch it on their laptop, or just ask me questions if they had already watched it, or not come in at all if you felt like you had a good handle on it, but to be available to discuss things. Uh, this week, we A, don't have a classroom, and B, Via, which is how I typically get downtown, uh, isn't running still. I have other means to get there um, going forward. Um, I can drive to Oshawa and then take the GO train from Oshawa to Union. Um, so that, until Via comes up, will be my plan. Um, this week was also, since we didn't have a classroom and things were hectic, my five-year-old started in-person school yesterday, and it wasn't clear if today was happening. So we, uh, we couldn't make it down today, uh, so I do apologize for that. I, um, I hate that I haven't gotten to see most of you in person. Um, uh, I know it probably didn't seem like I hated it. Uh, last year was absolutely bonkers, as you guys all know. Um, for me, for you, for our administration, you know, I just can't even imagine the amount of stress they're under right now. Um, uh, but I do enjoy teaching in the classroom. Um, I want to be safe. Um, I am not going to stand there at the door and ask you to show me proof of vaccination. I'm going to ask that you honor, honor the intent of the system. Um, thinking specifically of the fact that I have, uh, a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old who cannot be vaccinated yet. Um, so even though I am absolutely 100% double vaccinated, uh, if I somehow was exposed to it and passed it on to my children, I, uh, I can't even, oh, the thought of that makes me want to puke just a little bit. Um, I can tell you that I have anxiety absolutely every day about the fact that they are, he is in in-person class right now. Uh, my big worry is if we get shut down again and uh, I suppose nobody wants to acknowledge it, but it seems like a very good likelihood that we get shut down. If we get shut down in any way, luckily we're set up to record, um, but my uh, five-year-old would have to be at home. We wouldn't have a nanny. So uh, last time, last year, I at least had a nanny on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. You guys saw, I think most of you were in my class last year. Some of you might have been in the year before. Um, but you guys, most of you saw how absolutely frantic I was last year. Uh, so there would be a lot of early recordings. I can tell you that because your class starts at nine o'clock on Thursday, uh, and a lot of this stuff wasn't even sorted out from the department um, uh, until late last night, um, I couldn't record this until Thursday morning. So it is 4 a.m. Uh, my kids are asleep upstairs. Uh, so there's going to be, if we do have to switch to fully online because we impose um, lockdown measures in Toronto again. A lot of my recordings will be done probably early morning. My hope will they will always be there for you by 9 a.m. start time so that you can watch them during your assigned time period. I'll do everything I can to make that happen for you guys. Uh, last year, they had told me my course was only two hours. This year it shows up in the timetable. Uh, it was supposed to be two 10 hour lectures, or sorry, 10 two hour lectures last year. Uh, this year it's showing up in the timetable as 12 three hour lectures. So I will be adding more information to the, to the lectures as much as I can. Um, I've added in a walking tour and I've made that uh, part of your project will actually be presented in person, assuming we can, uh, we will present those um, uh, on the very last day of class. That's not the final project submission. 
that is part two of the project and we'll get into the project stuff um uh i haven't updated the outline to match this year's information most of it's the same but there's going to be weird little things that are different um uh i'm just dawning on me that i don't have a slide in here that talks about kind of the outline of uh the course breakdown so i'll wing some of that as we go through i could even pull up the syllabus i guess for us to look at so let's see what slides i have in here so the class uh i will always have the powerpoint to you before class uh, so that you can follow along it might get updated after class sometimes just as i'm talking to myself here uh i think of things that i add to the slides um so that later when you're watching the video it might not look if you're watching it later it might not perfectly match <clears throat> sometimes you guys ask such great questions during the class when we can be in person that it i think it should be added in so uh, sometimes it will get re-updated after the class when it's applicable, I'll upload videos by lecture time. This morning, uh, to make this lecture just a little bit longer, and I think that the thing people struggle with the most is free body diagrams, I'm gonna record the lecture I had planned on providing and giving. And then Dave, when he gets, well, when the kids get up, I'll be stop recording, post my video, uh, and then um, after I drop the kids off at daycare and school, I have a series of slides set up for Dave to record a, a video for, where what I've done is gone around and taken um, pictures of things around, and he's gonna be blindsided. He knew, he knew I was doing it, so he's probably guessed at some of them, but he's gonna be blindsided by the series of pictures that come up and he is going to draw the free body diagrams of those things. And he's gonna talk through why and how he's making those choices. So obviously I'm gonna refresh you on free body diagrams, but then Dave's gonna just walk through like, I think it's like 20 pictures where he's gonna draw the various free body diagrams just to kind of really drive at home what we're trying to do with that. Uh, same as all of my lectures, the first lecture slide will have the learning points. The last lecture slide will sum up those learning points. So remember, five-year-old, three-year-old. Um, this is the thing that really sucks, is the uh, policies for daycare and school. Uh, and I would hope for me coming into you guys as well, is that if even one person in our house has a runny nose, we have to stay home. So daycare has a zero tolerance policy. If they have a runny nose, I have to keep them home. Uh, I have to keep everyone home. Um, they need a swab. If it comes back negative uh, and the symptoms don't get worse and we can figure out and get a doctor's note that it is you know, a runny nose from a cold because it's not COVID, they're allowed back in. But that can take two to three days for what would be not even a blip in my radar uh, pre-COVID. So uh, there may be one or two emergency lectures that are done online. It's not what I want to do. Trust me, it's actually way harder to set up everything and find the time to record this, especially if then I have to, if I'm going downtown or however we're working it out, um, uh, it, it's actually way harder to record these online. I'd much rather be there in person. Plus, I get to get out of my house if I go downtown. Um, hopefully, uh, I know one of the big complaints last year was the sound of my recordings. So I shelled out the big bucks and got a really good microphone. I got a camera stand. Still maybe not the best camera. Um, they don't give us any money to buy this stuff. So, uh, I mean, they do, but it's it's weird and convoluted and it would it's it's really hard to actually get the money. So. So I'm buying this stuff and I don't know, maybe my kids will make use, use of it when they start gaming uh, and they can record YouTube videos, who knows. Um, but uh, hopefully you find the sound quality just a little bit better than last year for those of you that were on it last year. Again, most of you have seen that 
if there's something I can do to improve, improve things. If you have advice on what that is, I will do everything I can to implement it. Sometimes I don't even know. Like I know last year, um, people it found it really hard to see the mouse on the screen. So I changed it to pink and giant so that you guys could see what was happening on the slides. Uh, I'm hoping that the camera that I have now can just quickly turn down to record um, handwriting so I don't have to like stop and start all of my lectures and then insert all of the math slides because sometimes I would get myself confused about what I had already said uh, and what I hadn't said. So um, I feel like I should add a slide in here um, for the course breakdown. So I'm going to make myself a note for the course breakdown slide. Sorry, I just want to write it down so I don't forget. It's very weird that I don't have that in here. Now, I will say last year I made I did these this um, course last year and some of you were in my classes last year. I was teaching five classes and in the fall I was teaching three of them. Two of them had to be switched to online, so the formats had already been set for years and they were switched online, which is a huge amount of work. And this course I was creating in real time last year, so um, it wasn't as fleshed out as I would have hoped because I was, it was, it was, I, I get PTSD sometimes when I, not to make light of PTSD in any way, I, like I literally sometimes wake up with a cold sweat thinking about last fall and kind of just the level of um, insanity that was happening around that. Um, so the course breakdown, let me, let me see, I'm going to try to bring up our uh, syllabus if I can. So you guys can't see it because it's on the other screen. I'll bring it up in just a second. But I'm not just being weird. I am hunting for our syllabus. So let's get to that. Electives this year because my mouse is giant it uh it's actually really hard to select things okay course outline let's bring this over here okay so we've covered all of this. Um, I should be your main course, main contact for things. I have office hours listed here from 12 to two. I think most of the kind of interaction you'll need with me can happen in the class as long as we can be in class. The um, undergraduate course I'm teaching was switched to being completely online. Uh, and its time slot was supposed to be 12 to 2 p.m. So I'm going to be still in the building. They are trying to assign me a classroom um, to use as a meeting space. So they demand we provide office hours, but then they don't give us a place to, to go. So there's no office for me to go to on the campus, uh, which wouldn't have been a problem. I usually would have gone to the, to the staff lounge or sat in the kind of cafeteria area. Uh, but you can't do that anymore with COVID. Um, so I can't just go sit in the building and work and wait for people to ask questions anymore. Um, so I'm hoping that they'll give me a classroom. So essentially I will be there from nine until two on Thursdays. Um, in the last two hours, the undergrads can ask me questions. I think most of our lectures will wrap up at two hours. Um, so we'll really have an, at the last hour of our class and into the two hours um, afterwards if people want to ask questions, but uh, it's probably be people coming and going. Um, me. So course description. So here are the lectures. Um, so today is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. We're going to talk about stairs, um, uh, basic and feature, um, and the way each course is going to go, 
I will talk about the loads that are needed to design those things or what assumptions get made on how we interpret the building code um, to apply it to the thing we want to do. And then we'll look at examples and talk about them. How were those built? Why were those built that way? Guards and canopies, uh, pedestrian bridges, light posts and fences, catenaries and fabric structures. I think some of you might have heard Dave give this lecture before, but it is a, a style of construction that you can have a ton of experience and still not know what you're doing. So to have access to one of the kind of leading world experts on catenaries and fabric structures, um, being Dave, uh, it's just too valuable not to talk about it. We want people knowing that it exists and how to do it. Um, and so Dave will give his catenary and fabric structures lecture. Street furniture, our installations and playgrounds. Um, the walking tour, assuming we can be in person, I have October 21st listed as our walking tour and discussion. Um, I will put a survey out closer to the tour asking um, I try to fully uh, respect people's health needs um, and also privacy um, so I don't want to be like who can't do it uh, but I also want to make it as fair as possible so I'll do uh, a survey that only I can see the results to um, and if you have any um, kind of concerns about doing a walking tour um, let me know and then we can try to communicate about how we could handle that um, if you have suggestions about stops in and around kind of the, kind of the core of the inner city, um, kind of in around U of T and places downtown, uh, we can stop and look at some things and Dave and I will walk through and talk about them and we'll talk about why they were built. We can look up close. Where was it welded? Why did they do this thing? How did these bolts look? What does the base look like? So I can think a few of the ones that I'd like to stop and look at, um, but if you have ones, I'll also put a spot where you can add suggestions of different things we'd want to look at. So a lot of canopies, um, we can't go into buildings that probably wouldn't be very safe. So exterior stairs, guard rails, um, art installations where there's a lot of art being installed uh, in the city of Toronto now. There will be a lot of art installations. I can think of two or three that are even my projects that we can stop and take a look at. Uh, then we'll talk about architecturally exposed structural steel, and I'll add in castings to that. And then a lecture on glass. Now, glass is usually designed by the supplier, but it needs to be very well understood by the base building engineer, and not a lot do. Um, simply because it's an unusual medium and it's a different design process. Uh, so both Dave and I have designed in glass. Um, maybe not some of the fanciest things like the Apple building. I'm not going to say it's our, or the old uh, Apple building in New York. I'm not going to say it's our, uh, that we're leading experts in it. Um, but we have, we are probably uh, kind of People come to us to, to talk about glass as well. So um, uh, we'll do a lecture on that. The last two lectures, what I'm going to do is not necessarily have them be lectures. Uh, Dave or I will be there in the classroom and we can have project discussions. People can talk about their projects with us. You guys can talk to each other about your projects. Um, it gives the opportunity to we can draw free body diagrams on the board and interact, just trying to flesh these out and making them the best they can. Uh, assignment one is just going to be, um, uh, it's gonna be worth 25% of your term. Doesn't miss the percentage here. Uh, it, it's gonna be worth 25% of the term. It's not going to be difficult. If there's math, it's quick, quick, quick math. It's mostly referencing, I believe, the first four lectures. It's on the sixth. Yeah, so <coughs> it's due on the sixth, and it will contain information from the first four lectures. Um, so I believe everyone in the course has taken some course of mine where you have done something online through Quercus. So you know the style of questions. They will be on the easier side of hard. 
Um, they will be, of course, open book with no time limit, but you have a week to complete it. Um, project part one, um, I believe I have what? The uh, project, so part one, you're gonna pick a feature element and the material used for the construction, and you're gonna draw a free body diagram. The goal here is that you're going to build a scale feature model of something. Um, so if there's a particular canopy you want to do, maybe there's a piece of um, uh, street furniture that intrigues you. Um, the idea here is that uh, we're talking about the structure. Um, you want it to be simple enough that you can build it, um, but you also want to do something cool. Uh, so you're going to start to think about what you're going to do there. I will get these, I forget what the ad drop date is, but I do mark these with comments. Um, what I do is I take your PDFs, you're going to submit those by PDFs. I will mark comments on the PDFs and re-upload them. I won't put your mark on it because anyone could access each other's marks and I don't think that's fair. I'll put comments on it, but then I'll input the marks uh, into Quercus, so you can go in and see only your own personal mark in Quercus there. Um, then uh, we have the next assignment due on the 10th, and I believe it is on um, the next four lectures that have um, lecture, lecture content. Um, so it's whatever ones are before that date. Um, it'll be the same format, 25%. Um, project, or so I guess on the 10th, um, project part two is um, build a feature element and predict a failure mode and explain it. So this is what I have us doing for, um, uh, let's go back and look at the dates. So that's due on the 25th. Let's go back and look at our dates here. So that is due on the last day of in-class lectures. So what I'm imagining there is that people will get up and present. You will also submit a PDF, and I'll just jot some notes down for that mark about your presentation. Um, remember, we would have just had two classes where you can talk through it with me and we can work on it. I know um, in-person presentations make people very nervous, but it's just a small group. Um, we're going to treat it like a conversation, but you should have a good handle on it. You can expect me, Dave, or other students to ask questions about your model. Um, and you're going to think about how it would fail. If you were loading it, what would cause it to fail? So why did you pick this? How did you build it? Why did you build it that way? And then also, how do you think it will fail? And then part three of the project which is due on the last day of the term. So you can submit it uh, um, uh, via PDF and it will contain a video of some sort. You are going to record yourself testing your object to failure. Uh, that's the fun part. You're also going to write a little report that goes with it, talking about how it failed, why it failed that way, and how it differed from your expectations. I do not mark based on whether your prediction matched your result. If your prediction was completely out to lunch and not even reasonable, yeah, I would probably take some marks off. But as long as you thought of something reasonable, it doesn't have to be that perfect, uh, or it doesn't have to be an exact match um, to, be, uh, to get marks. That's not what we're doing here. This is supposed to be a learning process, so I don't want it to be marked um, based on whether you predicted it right, because that's hard to do. I don't even know if I could get that right every single time. Maybe your glue was a bad batch. Like there's just, that's not a fair way to mark it. But the process of, of figuring out how you think it's gonna fail is a big part of what engineers do. So I think it's important that you go through that process. Um, so I think that was most of the course breakdown. So I'll, I'll just minimize that and we'll get back to this now. So structural refresher. This is what today's lecture is going to be. We're going to just refresh ourselves on the types of loads, 
vectors, again, we're not going to be doing, we're going to be doing barely any math in this course. It's more just um, that vectors are, are part of what we draw on a free body diagram. So I just want a quick refresher. Uh, I'm going to remind you about force and moment and how they look different and how you would draw them. Free body diagrams. I'm going to remind you about strength, stiffness, and stability quickly. I uh, remind you about limit state design, the types of loads, which are apparently was so important. I put it in here twice. And then um, I'll give you just like a Cole's notes of material review. And then we'll talk about loads and serviceability and vibration. Um, what do we use for something that's not a building? Uh, what serviceability, serviceability criteria do we use? When and why would we do vibration checks? So statics, you guys should remember that this, this is the branch of mechanics that is concerned with the analysis of loads. So that means forces and torque or moment on physical systems in static equilibrium. That is in a state where the relative position of subsystems do not vary over time or where components and structures are at a constant velocity. We are saying they stay still. Everything in our course should be about static objects, things that stay still. There might be a moving component in it, or it's part of a moving component, but we are analyzing things that are staying still. If it moves, it's not statics, and we consider it a failure. Now, I'm not talking about deflection. I'm not talking about vibration. I'm talking about if it moves in space, up or down or spins, not incremental tiny movement that we see as a result of load deflections. Um, we're talking about large scale displacements. That would be mechanics and you need to go talk to Alex or Ted about that stuff or Bomani. They're going to be the ones that can talk to you about some of that. So equilibrium, static equilibrium. It's not moving or rotating. I low-key want Dave to wake up so he can make me another coffee, but I also don't want my children to wake up, so I'm very torn here. So each structure is subjected to a series of loads that try and move the structure. So everything that's acting on everything is trying to move each other. Us standing on Earth we're trying to push down on the earth, but we're also trying to pull the earth up. We are exerting very little force on the earth and it has a very big mass, so it's not going to be impacted much by us. Um, so those can be self-weight, live loads, wind loads, earthquake, ice, rain. Um, there can be all kinds of different loads. We want our course is about the structure not move. And by move, I'm talking about remaining in equilibrium. I'm not talking about small scale deflections. I'm talking about remaining in equilibrium. To remain in equilibrium, there must be an equal and opposite force to keep it in place or reactions. If there's something trying to push it down, there needs to be something trying to push it up. If there's something trying to push it this way, there needs to be something trying to push it this way. If there's something trying to spin it like this, there has to be something trying to push back in that direction. There are different ways to make that happen. And we're gonna look at those when we talk about our free body diagrams and vectors and forces and couples. So the units you should know, again, we're not gonna do a lot of moving back and forth, but you should have your handle, a handle on it because when you do your project, you're gonna wanna draw for me what you're imagining your real size object is with dimensions, I should see that. Free body diagram should be about your real object. And then you should also draw what your scale model is with dimensions and how they relate to each other. So you should know um, how length converts within metric and then imperial and metric and then within imperial. Force or mass, if you guys remember, one kilonewton, which is what we're going to use the majority of the time is kilonewtons to talk about loads. Um, one kilonewton is a thousand newtons. A thousand newtons is, to give you a sense of scale, about 102 kilograms 
or about 225 pounds. So one kilonewton is about 225 pounds, just to get your head around what that is. Pressure or um, uh, area loads, we talk about in KPA or MPA, one MPA is one newton per millimeter square. So over a one millimeter by one millimeter area, we have one newton. One MPA is a thousand KPA, which means one KPA is one kilonewton over a one meter by one meter area. Moment, which is that uh, load that tries to spin things, is in kilonewton meters. And one kilonewton meter, because sometimes if we're talking about things in MPA, we want it in newtons and millimeters, one kilonewton meter is a million newton millimeters because we need to multiply, uh, so we need, this is a thousand, uh, a thousand newtons make a kilonewton and a thousand millimeters make a meter. So this is a million. So force, if you guys remember, force is Newton's second law. Uh, force is the product of mass and acceleration. So we all have mass. The object we are on in space can help dictate acceleration or applied loads can dictate acceleration. Uh, force has magnitude and direction is, and is represented by a vector. We usually, since we're only talking about force and not multiple different types of vectors, we tend to forget that we're talking about a vector and we often draw things in 2D. And so we still then tend to forget that we're talking about a vector. But a vector needs magnitude and direction to know what its value is. Its direction is equally important as its magnitude. For us, the common unit of force is going to be a kilonewton, which is a thousand newtons. One newton is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared. We talked about that a little bit in um, uh, the first structures course. Um, some of you might have taken it. Well, I guess I don't think anyone would have been, anyone in this would have taken ARC uh, 1046, which is the new version of ARC 2044. So I think all of you would have been in 2044. Uh, we talked about this. We're not really going to worry about kind of this definition, but we do need to know that force has magnitude and direction. So this arrow is in three dimensions. This is a really bad drawing because is this just in the Z Y plane or is it shooting off somewhere in the X direction as well? So that's why um, sometimes graphically we like to switch it to 2D to make it more obvious and we work in two dimensions at a time. Or we will indicate things with um, degrees to help show us or clarify this information. Moment. So moment causes a body to rotate. So that's that act of spinning. If you apply, apply a force eccentric to the body's center of mass, it will cause it to rotate. The farther you are away, the more it tries to spin. Anyone who sat on a teeter-totter knows this. Anyone who's used a lever to try to open something, um, the more it wants to rotate. The distance is E, or eccentricity, uh, or the moment arm, sometimes, depending is what we'll call it. The moment is the force times the eccentricity. But this eccentric force still tries to cause it to slide. It try, ca causes that object to move and spin. So we need to represent this. If we wanted to talk about this as a moment, it's not just the moment because it's also trying to cause it to slide. So this being equal to this is a moment causing it to spin and a force through the centroid causing it to slide. So these two things are equal. I should have that F there. So slide eight, add F. So that should have the force written right here as well. 
if we don't want it to slide and just spin, or if we had something that was causing it to spin and we wanted to rewrite it as forces instead, to stop it from sliding, we would have to have an equal and opposite force pushing from the other direction. So both of these forces cause the object to spin in the same direction. So that's the same as this spinning. And we know that the magnitude of this moment is F times E plus F times E because they're both causing it to spin and a moment is a force times an eccentricity and we have two of them and we're adding them up. But the first force is trying to slide it up and the second force is trying to slide it down and they're both F so they're equal. So it isn't sliding. We have two equal and opposite forces stopping this from sliding. So this is just a pure moment. It can be written as forces and eccentricity when required. So uh, the moment on an object can be represented by an equivalent force couple. The two forces have to be a distance away that F times E plus F times E equals M. But since, the, but since the forces are acting in opposite directions, the object will only spin, not spin and slide. <clears throat> so free body diagrams. Since the loads on an object can start to get complex and hard to keep track of, it's really hard to keep track of it in your head, we like to draw pictures of it. And those pictures have uh, developed kind of a whole scientific method to them um, and we call them free body diagrams where we don't care about all of the bits we don't care about how pretty it is what we care about is essentially a stick figure representation of our object where we are drawing all the things that try to make our object move and all the things that stop our object from moving so all of, and so by move, that can be translation or rotation. I'm using move to describe both of those. So we want all of the moments and reactions and for the forces, moments, and reactions on the object. This is a free body diagram. For the purpose of statics, the sum of all of the forces in each direction should equal zero, and all the moments about each axis should equal zero. And that is our proof that is in equilibrium. If, it, if that doesn't happen, we have a moving object and now it's mechanics and not statics. And we haven't met the criteria we've set out to achieve in our object. So your free body diagram needs to have all the forces acting on the body through the center of mass where it's applicable. If not, we should have dimensions for those things. All the moments acting on the body, so anything that tries to cause it to rotate, that could be force couples as well. All the restraints to keep the body in equilibrium. Loki feel like somebody has woken up in my house. Um, all the restraints to keep the body in equilibrium. So that's all the reactions. If it's sitting on the ground, we know that. If there's friction in one spot, we want to draw that in. If um, uh, somebody's holding on to it because it's an object in the air, that hand is the reaction. And then all dimensions from a reference point to any of the forces, moments, or reactions. That allows us to complete our calculations. So free body diagrams. This one's easy. The car is not moving. It's sitting on the ground flat. We have the weight acting down and we have the reactions at both wheels. We often draw these in two dimensions uh, just because it makes life easier. So you are expected to understand that this RF, which isn't a subscript for factored here, it's the reaction of the front tire. And this is the reaction of the rear tire. And the front tire, we know because we've all seen cars, that there's two of those. So this is uh, taking that car and squishing it into a one dimensional plane. So this is representing both front tires and this is representing both back tires. We could do a section this way through the car if we wanted. I should draw that right here. I'm gonna see if, I'm, I'll try to get that in. 
slide 11 alt section. Well, maybe not right here, because right here I have the car on a hill. Uh, if this is not moving, so this is a parked car, it isn't going anywhere. We don't want it to go anywhere. We don't have uh, an applied load for acceleration here of load or force being applied to it, which would be the motor causing it to move. This is sitting here still. That's what we care about. We have the weight acting down. We have the reactions normal to the car, whereas the that's where the ground is pushing back. But is this car sliding down the hill? We hope not. That means that there is a reaction here stopping it from sliding down the hill. And that is going to be based on the coefficient of friction. We could sum this up knowing what the coefficient of friction is and find that it doesn't work and our car slides and we have a problem. Um, anybody can ask Dave about that anytime he wants. Um, so we have a weight coming down, we would, it looks like we have two different axes acting here. So we would want to break this into an X and Y component and this into an X and Y component, or we could sh rotate our axes and shift this into components normal to these forces. There's different ways we can go about it. And then we could solve for this if we had some basic information. A uh, free body diagram, a person with the wind blowing on them. Uh, we would have the wind acting as a, a, a line load trying to push me over. We have my self weight pushing down. We have the reactions of both of my feet stopping me from going down into the center of the earth. And we have both feet stopping the wind from sliding me along. Sometimes we have seen that one of these reactions might be zero. If I lifted, uh, what if I was wearing um, a hockey skate on this foot and Velcro uh, soles on my sneakers on this foot? So this hockey skate would be essentially zero friction relative to this foot, and maybe Rx1 would be zero. That's not often what we do with our feet, but that's what we do when we're talking about a pin roller condition. We know that there can be some movement on one side that doesn't mean the object is flying out into space, but there would just be no reaction there to take the load. There's nothing there to take that load. So that side could slide, not in this particular example. In this one, both feet would be stuck to the ground and they would stop me from sliding. And let's, well, actually, let's just see. We have uh, our dimension. Ooh, we're missing a dimension to my centroid here. So slide 13 X to Shannon. So you've seen these slides before. These are the free body diagrams of some beams that we'd typically see. This is representing a pin roller. And what's happening here is this beam is probably sitting on two columns. And the reason we're saying this is a roller is that as the load's applied to be released from force, you only need the tiniest bit amount of movement. And most columns are detailed that they could just, like we're talking about a fraction of a millimeter and all of a sudden that force is released. It's not one side that is really seeing it. Um, it would be uh, both sides that are moving a tiny little bit, but we know that this isn't sliding off into space. So we, uh, we make the assumption that one side is the pin because we know it's not going to slide off into space because it's connected there. But by acknowledging that there's some splaying of those columns, we can indicate one side as a roller and one side as a pin. And when we go through most of these calculations, we see that that Rx reaction is in fact zero. If we had an applied load along here and it was not zero at that Rx, we would need to detail that. Most of the time that isn't the case, 
But if we went through this and found we needed it, we would have to deal with it. And so this exercise is good because if we see that we got a reaction there, we know as the engineers that we have to do something about that. So this is what the free body diagram for the reactions would look like. We have our pin, which stops it from going up and down and back and forth. It does not stop rotation. A roller in this direction, so it's rolling in this direction, stops movement up and down. It doesn't stop movement back and forth and it doesn't stop rotation. A cantilever. This is how we would draw a moment connection into a reaction or into a support. And this would have um, uh, the ability to stop translation up and down, translation back and forth, and the ability to stop rotation. So we have a reaction up and down, back and forth, and rotation. These are hard to build. We don't like designing moment connections. So we don't do it unless we have to. They're not very efficient. They're hard to build and expensive. We don't like it. If it's there, we have to do it though. So you're thinking, what the hell, Shannon? What do you mean? We don't wanna do it, but if it's there, we have to. Well, it's as simple as that. If you don't need to have a moment connection, don't make it moment connected. And then if you don't make it moment connected, you don't have to design it to be moment connected. If you make it moment connected, even if you didn't need to, you have to design it for the moment connection. We'll do some examples with that when Dave starts to draw the free body diagrams in a little while. I love this one because it's totally crazy. We have, uh, so actually let's go back up to this one for a second. What stops this? We can see we have arrows stopping it going up and down and we can see we have an arrow stopping it from going back and forth. What stops it from spinning in space? Well, we can see that we have two arrows both going this way, but we haven't assigned values to those. We don't know what they are. Those are placeholders representing the possibility of it not going up and down, because we know we can design that. Um, what stops it from spinning is the fact that we have two reactions some distance apart. And that distance apart means that those arrows might actually be like that. And if we had an applied moment, those reactions could be like that, being our couple as a reaction, our force couple as a reaction. So knowing these are placeholders is the acknowledgement of how this isn't spinning in space. So this is a roller fixed guide. It's being stopped from going up and down here, but not stopped from rotation. It's not being stopped from sliding back and forth this way either. Over here, we have a slider in this direction, so it's a roller like this. We have a reaction here like this. So we have a reaction up and we have a reaction like this. They go through the same plane, so we don't have a moment couple. But look at this, this dark solid filled in triangle means moment, uh, moment connection. That means we've got a moment connection to whatever this is. So there's something stopping it from rotating, but not stopping it from moving up and down. This is a bonkers condition that we wouldn't often design. Uh, I have seen something designed like this twice in my career and in one of them, the loads were light and it was hard to do, but it was designed. Uh, the other one was an absolute beast of a calculation that between Dave and I took us probably a week to resolve and detail. It was huge loads. It was for Goldring. The architect had very specific imagery of what they wanted to see at that detail. Um, and after we designed it um, and they got into production, they were like, oh, Ah, we could just do it this way and they got rid of the need for the very complicated connection it meant a compromise on their architectural design um, and we had given them that feedback that this is an expensive complicated detail and they could do a few other things if they were willing to compromise on their architecture 
we don't tell you to compromise on your architecture. We can make suggestions on what might make it cheaper or easier to build, uh, but it is my job to try to find a way to do the thing you want to do. Very, very rarely is the answer no. There is almost always a way to do the thing you want to do. It might not be a smart thing to do, and that's your job to know, but I can give you guidance because you might not know it's not a smart thing to do. So it's my job to tell you how to do it, but then also give you guidance to say, hey, maybe this isn't the smart thing to do. We could do it, but it might not be the smartest thing to do. There might be a very good reason why you want it done though. So you guys are all probably uh, cringing in fear, remembering these diagrams, but these are our typical beams. These are some free body diagrams. This is a simply supported beam with a point load in the middle. So we've got a reaction up, a reaction up, and a reaction in this direction. It can't go up and down, it can't slide back and forth, and it can't rotate because we have two reactions that aren't in the same, uh, they don't go through the same point in space. If they go through the same point in space, they can't stop rotation. But these are parallel to each other, so we can stop uh, rotation here. We have a simply supported beam with uniformly distributed loads. So we have reactions up and down. We have our reaction here stopping it from sliding. And this is a load spread out over it. It would be like the difference between these is me sitting in the middle of the table versus me laying out perfectly and spreading my load everywhere all over the table. So strength, stiffness, and stability. You guys have all heard me say this a multitude of times. Everything you need to know about structures, you actually already know. What we spent the past two courses doing in the core classes was teaching you a bunch of stuff that unfortunately makes you forget the things you intuitively know. And I'm not gonna lie, this is a thing engineers butt their head up against all the time. They are notorious for getting, for forgetting the things they instinctively already know. And that's why I like, before you even talk about numbers, to draw yourself a little diagram. I don't know, maybe something like a free body diagram, but it doesn't have to be as complex, it doesn't have to be as precise. Just stop and think about what is stopping a thing from moving. What stops it from going up and down? What stops it from sliding? And what stops it from spinning? And do those members look right? Do we expect to see it deflect a bit? And you're gonna find you intuitively have a lot of these answers. So strength, strength is about life safety. It's the amount of load a structure can sustain prior to failure. So this means, is it going to rupture? Are we gonna get excessive permanent deformation? Is it gonna buckle because of the load applied to it? I know we have buckling instability as well because these things can jump around a little bit, but if you like go back and look at um, some of those lectures uh, slides where I talked about strength, stiffness, and stability, we're not gonna get too much into it, but you should be able to understand when, when something is stable or not because Part of your project is going to be drawing the diagrams that are required to keep it stable. Stiffness is the amount of force to make a structure deflect by some fixed increment, or how much does it deflect under a certain load. This does not mean does it move in space. We're talking about with it staying in space, what are the internal things that happen to the object? And stability means it is not going up and down, side to side, or rotating in space. And if you guys remember, we check strength, stiffness, and stability for every connection and every element and every system in our structure. So a quick refresher about our strength loads. I'll even use my handy dandy uh, foam block here. Uh, compression is squashing something and we get kind of even squashing of all of our little blocks as we apply our load. My foam block isn't great for this, especially because it wants to buckle. I'll brace it here. So you can see they're all kind of squashing equally. It's hard to do with the foam block, but you get the idea. 
tension really doesn't work with the foam block because I can't, it just tears. Tension is stretching. And if I had on that hair elastic, I usually, sometimes I actually have an actual elastic that I draw on with a marker that you can see those incremental lines. Um, I should steal Malcolm's old, he had this giant elastic, I should steal it. And when he was two until he was three and a half, he called it his line toy. And it was his favorite toy. He's, I love that kid, but he's a kooky little dude. Uh, and he was obsessed with his line toy for years. Um, so that's compression and uh, tension. I had kind of a thought about shear. I know people hate shear and um, it's actually easy to calculate, but understanding what it is drives people nuts. And I always say it's about two forces slipping along a plane. And then we look at a multitude of planes side by side and what happens over that. A deck of cards is a really good way to kind of talk about this. So we have a deck of cards and if I put um, a force on one side and a force on the other and there was something kind of lining these up, we would get slippage that looked like that. So we would get kind of this skewed thing. And we've got slippage along every single little plane of that deck of cards. And so we have the shear. We can be talking about the shear is what's happening from this side all the way to this side. But we're acknowledging that it is a series of incremental small planes. Bending. Bending is when uh, we um, uh, put moment of some sort on an object. Um, and we see that we have one side go in compression and one side go in to tension. Depending on what direction we're applying that moment, if we're applying the moment like this, the bottom is in compression and the top is in tension. If we apply it like this, the top is in compression and the bottom is in tension. Strength for torsion. Torsion is this act of twisting the object. Uh, it's kind of um, a moment shear uh, application. We're again not going to spend much time on this unless you think you have an object that has torsion acting on something very um, explicitly. We won't really talk about it, but we could talk about it in terms of your specific project when the time comes. So if you remember, this is not the system we do anymore. Um, um, Dave is awake. You're not visible on the camera if you go through the stairwell. I don't know. You're probably still half asleep and in your pajamas. <laughs> not really wanting people to see you at the moment. Um, because he would have come down the stairs right there and normally walked through this room so he really is all like his head's half all he's all squished up um so strength yeah sorry about that um load on a system uh strength load on a system uh, factor of safety is the method we don't use anymore. Uh, and the idea there was that we needed our capacity to be greater than our factor load. And if you guys remember, I've talked about this analogy a lot. If we have this table here, we have this grand old table and I am the applied load on it. This table is carrying the weight of the table and me, and maybe maybe we have um, uh, an epoxy finish on this table. Uh, and um, maybe when they were making this, and we needed the load of me, the weight of the table, and the epoxy finish to be less than the capacity. But if I went away and ate a cheeseburger and had a beer and came back and sat on this table and it was only perfectly designed, the table would collapse. And that doesn't seem very practical. If uh, it turns out that they put a thicker epoxy finish on this and I sat on it and it was only perfectly designed, it seems like a bit of a flaw and I would break the table. 
the problem, so that's why we would say, okay, let's, let's say we've got the weight of the table, the weight of the epoxy finish, and the weight of Shannon, and we will multiply it by a factor of safety of two, or three, or four, or five, um, depending on the criteria, and make sure that that factor of safety applied load is less than the capacity. So uh, it was, let's say it was three times, Shannon, the table, and the epoxy finish needs to be less than the capacity. So that was a great way to do it. It didn't leave much refining in the process. So it's not a very refined process. So what they do now is they say, okay, the odds of Shannon going and eat, eating a cheeseburger is greater than the epoxy finish being off. And then even then, the thickness of the epoxy finish being off can only be in a smaller increment. I could do more than go out and eat a cheeseburger and have a beer. I could get pregnant and have a baby. I could put a backpack on. I am not pregnant, by the way. Uh, I could put on a backpack and sit on that table. So um, not only is the odds more likely that it would increase, but the variability in it is greater as well. So the problem with this system, the factor of safety system, is that it treated everything equally. The way we do it now is we also say on top of that, then with the table itself, what if the flaw, what if we perfectly designed it for the weight of Shannon, the epoxy finish, and the weight of the table, and nothing changed? Um, but what if um, they used a, a slightly lighter grade wood or less grade wood than we had planned on it? What if there was a knot in it? What if there was a minor flaw in it? And so the factor of safety system doesn't capture that quite the same way either. So what we do now is we factor the loads on the system and we reduce the capacity of the object. So we factor the loads, but we don't factor them equally. We would apply a, a particular factor to Shannon we would apply a particular factor to the epoxy and to the weight of the table because maybe they made the table just a little bit thicker. But then also on top of that, we would reduce the capacity of the wood of the table that's holding it all up in case there was some minor flaws in there. And then that reduced capacity needs to be greater than the load on the, the factored load on the system. So we're factoring the load and we're reducing the capacity and then the subscript F means we factored it. The subscript R means we've reduced the capacity. This is called limit states design. So what kind of loads do we need to consider in this process? Well, there's dead loads, which are permanent loads. Um, so that would be, in our table example, the weight of the table itself and the epoxy finish on it. You, as the architect or the designer, are making those choices. The live loads on the object are variable, and it is dictated in the code by what the object is. Specifically, I'm talking about buildings here. Snow load is a climatic load, and we talked about how that is based on the code and statistical data based on where in the world we are and what the value of those loads are. Wind load, very similar. Earthquake is a rare load uh, that we do worry about, and it is based on a very large return period uh, for the worst case earthquake. But we don't factor it, because we expect that if we do see that catastrophic um, earthquake load, uh, it's about life safety. We're, we're trying to survive that earthquake, um, and if some things get damaged, uh, we don't care so much. We just want people to be able to get out of that building alive. And then we have some other ones like temperature, shrinkage, moisture, settlement, or any combination of those. We could have soil loads um, trying to cause something to tip over. And we could have pre-stress, which would be a permanent load. So uh, if I know, for example, um, uh, I had something that wanted to push on this platform, um, but I had a column here, maybe I'd tighten this string and then as I load it, I'm, un, I'm releasing the load in the elastic. And as long as I don't release it to the point that it uh, 
buckles, which it wouldn't take much to buckle it, but as long as I have tension in that, it can act as a column. So we're usually going to be working in loads that are in kilonewtons and kPa. Um, we're not going to be solving things to their core here, so we're not going to have to worry about that. We're not going to go really into MPAs for the material properties. So we're not going to be doing quite as much conversion for those sorts of things. Um, let me see what I wrote here. So uh, we then combine loads as prescribed in the NBCC or the OBC, so that's the National Building Code of Canada, or the Ontario Building Code, and ensure that the worst combination of these for each load type is less than the reduced capacity. Governing combos may differ for different load types. So different things in the building might be governed by different combinations of these loads. I shouldn't have pushed that down. All right, let's move this over a little bit. I made myself too big here. Okay, so steel. Let's just have a quick refresher about steel. It's very strong. It's very stiff. Uh, but because of that, we often don't need as much of it. And it gives the impression that it can be not as stiff, even though it's because it's so strong that we need less that we start to have to worry about stiffness. Uh, because it's so strong, we can also take away a lot of it, which means in columns, uh, buckling is a thing that we have to worry about more often. It could actually be governed by buckling because it's so strong. Uh, quality control is great on steel. Uh, it's made in a foundry or in a very specific shop where they have a chemist testing uh, the steel as it's being made. Their mill precision is very precise. It's isotropic, which means a cube of steel behaves the same in this direction and this direction and this direction. It doesn't matter what direction it's in, the way it behaves is the same. Lead time is required. That's a negative side about steel. Um, it takes a while to order uh, in the, this kind of pandemic world. Everything is off the charts about what is and isn't available when. Um, there are crazy surprises every time I'm doing everything, anything on a project. Um, on one project, rigid insulation wasn't available for six months. They were saying that there was a 13-month lead time on something that would normally be a two-week lead time. Steel also has a specialized workforce. Uh, so people have to be qualified to work in steel. I can't just go into my back room and build something out of steel very easily. Um, you need to weld and to weld structurally, you have to be certified. Uh, the properties of steel, FY was 350 MPA. Most of the time, I'm gonna add that just steel. I'm gonna put in brackets 345 because remember, the steel is 350 MPA, but if it's been a hot rolled section, that's when we heat it up to red hot and roll it into our shape. We actually get a slight reduction because of the way it cools and the way we've rolled it. Um, so we only use 345 MPA for hot rolled sections, even though it was created with 350 MPA steel. E is 200,000 MPA. And our reduction factor on the reduction side for steel is almost always 0.9. So how does steel fail most of the time? Beams typically fail in bending when we're talking about strength, but because we need so little material because they're so strong relative to other materials, it gives the appearance that they're not that stiff, even though the material itself is stiff. So often the design of the members is governed by stiffness. So if you guys remember when we did all of those steel beams, we went through a whole life safety check where we found what the moment was and we found what the deflection was. And we, uh, uh, just remember that we can see you in the reflection. So keep your pants on. Um, our upstairs of our house is very tiny, so Dave's closet is off of the kind of bathroom 
downstairs. So the poor guy, when he wakes up, has to come downstairs uh, and kind of get ready for the day in there. He did it anyway, so it seemed to work out great. And I have a much bigger closet upstairs. And our house is very weird, where an addition was built off of uh, the side. And there's a mirror or a window, the old original window, into the addition. And there's a door around that room over there. But it means we have all of these weird reflections. Like sometimes in this mirror, I can see out through here into our backyard. It's it's bizarre. And you, you Somebody can always be watching in this house. It's a very creepy kind of situation. Um, so if you guys remember last year, or whatever year you took my course, uh, we did all of this work for moment and sheer, and then went through and found that stiffness, remember I, which was representing our deflection because it was our moment of inertia, uh, which was part of our deflection equation, um, governed our ultimate design. So we did all of this for strength to find that stiffness governed. We still have to do all of that, but because steel is so strong, it gives the appearance that stiffness is governed. Columns are pretty similar. Um, if they're short, if it's a, uh, if it's a really short column, it's going to be governed by squashing. If it's a really tall column, it's going to be governed by buckling. Again, because steel is so strong, we take away so much of it and we're left with a slender element that could be governed by buckling. And that tends to be what governs our steel. Wood. Wood is organic. Um, there are lots of factors that we have to consider because wood is a grown object. Um, so we have things like the moisture in it, um, it creeps. How long is the load duration? So that's the creep part. There was all kinds of different factors that we looked at within the wood. One thing is, is that it's easy workforce. You can find lots of people that will work with wood or know how to work with wood. You don't need special training to work with wood. It's fast construction. Once you have the lumber, you can build it quickly. You can see that I have short lead time uh, for stick frame construction. That at the moment isn't quite true simply because I'm sure all of you have heard how wood prices skyrocketed over the past year and I mean like off the charts uh, like more than doubled in a lot of markets uh, it's coming back down I don't think it'll ever go down to what it was but compared to what it was um, even in May uh, it's wildly different so we have a wide variety in properties for wood. Because it's organic and we don't make it, we're literally going down and cutting it down from the forest. Uh, we have a wide variety and there was all kinds of tables and charts that helped us pick what one was applicable to what we were doing. So not only do we have um, a wide variety, we have different values depending on what the wood is doing because it is non-isotropic which means the way it behaves in this direction and this direction and this direction is different. So how it bends, the capacity is different than how it shears, which is different than how it behaves under axial force or axial force. Its E or its stiffness varies based on the properties of the wood. And the reduction factor is 0.8 for compression and tension and 0.9 for moment and shear. So how does wood fail most of the time? Well, the beams typically uh, fail in shear or bending because our shear values are so much lower than our bending values. In steel, we saw that shear capacity was usually huge compared to our bending capacity. Uh, in wood, our capacity for shear is so low that it might fail in shear. So it's a much more important uh, check, but still, because our stiffness is so low, stiffness might govern. But wood, it's, it's a toss-up. Sometimes it's deflection, sometimes it's shear, sometimes it's bending. Uh, in steel, I find it's almost always, always deflection. Rarely is it bending or shear, but we check them. But it's usually stiffness. Uh, wood, it is probably an even mix-up about what governs it. 
columns. It's buckling if they're short and a combination of buckling and compression if they're tall. And it depends on if they're braced or not. Remember, if it's screwed into plywood, it's a lot harder. If this was my wood column and it wants to buckle, but right here it's screwed into plywood, remember it didn't take much to stop something from buckling. You can see now I've changed its buckling length to where I've screwed it into the plywood. Well, what if we screwed it into the plywood all the way down its length? We're really gonna get a reduction on the buckling there. Tension forces are difficult to design in wood. We have a hard time building things in tension out of wood. So if whatever you do for your object, you're imagining having a wood object in tension, probably not a great idea. Uh, connections govern almost everything in wood. You're gonna get large connection forces in any wood object. So concrete. Concrete is a composite material. So we have steel, well actually they're in the concrete itself or the cement. We have cement aggregate, which is stone and our sand all mixed together. So that's composite. And then within that, because concrete is really good in compression, but horrible in tension, steel is great in tension. So we put it in the concrete to do the tension job. And because now the steel is braced for buckling, we, uh, it, can, it can be part of uh, compression as well, but it won't um, do too much damage. Rebar is good in tension because it's our steel. In concrete, we build things twice. We have to build the forms and then we cast the concrete and we've built the concrete part and then we take the forms away. That means it's really good when it's repetitive, when we can take those forms and bring them up to the next story and repeat the same process. If uh, you're not doing that, it's not as economical. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but anything that allows you to repeat using that same formwork is what makes it affordable. It's slow construction. So you have to wait if you're doing multiple stories. It is, uh, you need to allow the concrete to cure. Then you can take the, the, uh, the formwork away and then you have to let it cure a little bit more before you can start to build on top of it. Concrete's pretty good for vibrations. It does, uh, it does a good job at um, uh, doing mass dampening. It's heavy, so it's uh, good for those vibration issues. Um, we need lots of mass, so it's very heavy. And the fact that it's very heavy can be its limiting factor a lot of the time. The properties. They vary depending on what concrete we make. And we don't know the exact concrete properties we have until we're actually there on site pouring it. So we tell them what we want. The people who are good at making concrete make it to match that criteria. Um, but they are thinking about how hot is it today? Is it raining today? Because all of that can go into play into the concrete strength. And then they pour it all into a, uh, a big truck and they spin it around and send it out to site. We don't know exactly how good it is until we cast our concrete cylinders and go test them. If there are any bakers, you know that the dough you use for a batter you use for a cake on one day that is cold and dry might turn out different than a hot summer's day. Same ingredients, same, same things done. You'll get a different cake and you might not know until you've poured it in the pan and you're cooking it. So our concrete is very similar. Concrete is uh, zero uh, capacity in tension and bending. Um, it has a compressive capacity of 15 to 50, but around 30 is pretty normal for our structural components. Um, rebar is out of steel, so our FY is 400 MPA, and our E uh, of concrete is um, related to the F prime C or our compressive capacity, so it varies. Our reduction factor for steel is 0.65 for the concrete itself and 0.85 for the steel itself. And then we have some combination of these things being used in the design. So how does concrete fail? Slabs often fail in shear. Uh, sometimes they'll fail in bending and we design them for both of them, but shear is for slabs kind of the real, uh, 
the real thing that needs to be obsessively looked at. Um, when you hear of um, concrete building failures, it's almost always a shear problem in a slab. And with that, I mean it's when the slab slips down around the concrete column. So the column stays and the slab slips down around it. Imagine trying to support um, jello on a series of toothpicks. Um, it would uh, slide, the jello would just slide down around the toothpick. If you put, um, um, I'm trying to think of, a, of a, a something you could use in your kitchen, but if you put um, uh, like a little flat top on that toothpick and tried to hold up the jello, it would be less likely to slide down around it. That's what we do with drop panels and capitals at the tops of our columns. Columns. Columns can fail in buckling and concrete, or if they're shorter, they'll fail in a combination of buckling and compression. Often, we have shorter concrete columns. It's not that they're shorter than our steel columns, it's that they're stockier, where we need them to be that size for strength, which means they're less likely to buckle. Tension forces are difficult in concrete. We put our steel in our bottom to deal with our tension, but to transfer that tension to something else is very difficult. So we wouldn't want to do a brace in concrete, for example, where we would have something in tension. It would be really hard to transfer those loads from that tension element into the rest of the concrete building. Rebar placement is crucial. Again, like I said, if our steel is doing our work in bending down here, our tension work, what if our steel got placed in the middle by mistake? What if it got placed at our neutral axis? Well, it's not doing anything at all, and all of this concrete is cracking up until our steel, meaning our beam is actually only this deep not this deep. Remember our effective depth in concrete went down to the steel? Well, if we put the steel in the wrong spot, that, be that becomes our effective depth and uh, uh, we have a much less deep beam. Do you guys remember how critical depth is in our strength designs? The deeper it is, the better it is. So losing a bunch of depth in our concrete beam if our steel isn't in the right spot is disastrous. All right, unique structures. What are some of the unique structures and how do we design them? So, oh, thank you. You can take the old one away. I did at one point say I low-key hoped you'd wake up and bring me a new coffee. Um, Dave, say hello to your students. This is our, uh, our elective. Hello, students. Uh, Dave is going to do part of <laughs> this lecture a little bit. Um, so, how do you design unique structures for strength? So how do we design for strength for unique structures? Well, if they fall into a category in our building code, no problem. We use the building code. We follow all the requirements within the building code and design it to meet that. If they don't fall into a category in our building code, do they fall into a category in another building code out there in the world? Because if so, that means somebody has tested it, thought about it, and written a code about it. And if we don't have it in our code, it is accepted that you can use another code. If it's in our code, our code trumps all. So you have to use our code. And it, this is true wherever you are in the world. But if it, you don't have a code that makes it explicit what to do, you can look at another code. If that doesn't happen, is there a precedent? We can look at precedent and we can go through what would typically be done. It is then our job to think about what loads could be anticipated. It doesn't have to be mandated in the code. We should think reasonably about what loads would be applied to this. So you can't say, uh, I didn't design my street furniture for somebody sitting in the middle of the bench because the code didn't say so. It is pretty obvious that it's a bench and someone is going to sit in the middle of that bench. So obviously you need to design for somebody sitting in that middle of the bench. And then after that, 
what would reasonable selection of practicing professionals do? And that is literally the definition of what our job is to do if it's not explicit in the code. What is a reasonable thing to do? And what would a selection, what if I went to another engineer and said, what would you do here? Would they come up with something similar? Or they might do something different, but would they say, oh yeah, I can see how that would work. That's a good way to do that. And as long as a reasonable selection of practicing professionals would do the same thing, it is a reasonable solution on how to, how to proceed. So the NBCC and the OBC, so that's the National Building Code of Canada and the Ontario Building Code, outline live loads, wind loads, and snow loads for buildings. They also contain snow loads and wind loads on some unique structure types. They, so that could be what falls into our category. We could look there for those. Um, guards have an explicit criteria listed separate from everything else that we can use for sure on guards, but sometimes those guards, be, those forces, because they are meant to prevent um, a single person doing damage to something, themselves or the object, uh, they are a good starting point for a lot of other objects that might not be listed in the code. And that is what is often done by practicing professionals in our industry. And then there are some structures that have specific standards that you can purchase, uh, often American ones, that have some pretty comprehensive guidelines. I have on some occasions purchased some of these codes just to see them say, it's just a list of other codes that they're referencing. That one is very frustrating. And ultimately, I have gone through it where I've gone through a series of five codes or five standards, which ultimately represent referenced a code that was referencing the guard load, essentially. It was a small variation in the guard load, but you know, I, I looked up this thing because it was this particular object and it was similar enough to this that it referenced another type of object and I went through and got all the way back to a guard load. So often a guard load is what we're gonna come back to. And if it's not a guard load, there's usually a pretty good reason why. And you can probably intuitively figure out when the guard load isn't gonna cut it. So we will, in each particular example that we look at, we will look at these things. So when we do guards, for example, does it fall into our building code? Uh, does it fall into another building code? Is there a precedent and what loading could be anticipated? So like I said, guards are explicit in our code. We'd look at that. But what if our guard uh, went up higher than the guard requirements? Well, then we'd say, okay, well, there's also the possibility that wind could be on it. And does it have a ledge on the top? Could somebody walk on that? Could somebody hang on it? Could snow accumulate on it? So just because it's a guard doesn't mean only the guard load is what we need to apply to it. Sometimes we have to say, okay, there are other loads that could reasonably be anticipated to occur on this thing. So unique structures, how do we design stability? Do we have a reaction location to resist all forces and moments? So that's where it's our job to think, do we have um, something to stop it sliding back and forth? Do we have something to stop it from going up and down? And do we have something to stop it from spinning? And stopping it can spin from spinning can be two reactions that aren't in the same plane or go through the same node. Um, if we have that, we can stop it from spinning. We have uh, the ability to stop it from spinning even if we don't have a moment reaction. Um, don't put a moment reaction where you don't need to because we don't like them. But don't forget to put a moment reaction where you need it because where we need it, we need it. And so Dave will do some um, free body diagrams that will look at that in a little bit as well. And so once we think about that, you should always draw your free body diagram. Your free body diagram really is the illustrative example to say that you have stability in your structure. If you can draw all of those reactions, you can know if you have stability in your structure. And again, intuitively you know this. Just stop and think about something. If, if I put a pin at the bottom of this pencil and tried to hold it up, 
it isn't stable. Intuitively, you know that. You know to keep this pencil stable, I'm gonna grip it with my fingers at the base like this. And this means it can't rotate. I am providing a moment reaction at the bottom of this pencil. But if I held it like this and I supported it this way, I wouldn't want to make a moment reaction at both of these if I didn't have to, because that would be a pain. I could get my moment reaction by having a couple. So stiffness, how do we design stiffness for unique structures? Well, first off, is there a criteria? Um, and so if there's already a criteria listed, we can meet that criteria. Do we need a criteria? Do we care about stiffness? If there's no finishes on it, and it's not a hazard if it overly deflects, and the owner is okay with it, and that's critical, the person paying to build this should be okay with having no criteria, and then if that doesn't work, what's a reasonable criteria? What's something that we could reasonably anticipate? Can we extract from something else? Is there something else that's similar enough to it that we could redefine it for this? And if we've done those things, we can develop our, our stiffness criteria. Now, stiffness also has usually vibration lumped into it, um, but I'm gonna talk about it almost as a separate thing here. Uh, and it's the exact same thing as stiffness. Is there a criteria to solve vibration problems? Or is there, is there a criteria to meet with vibration? Do we need a criteria? Remember, vibration falls into stiffness, which is often about people's comfort and uh, preservation of finishes. So if it's not a life safety issue, do we need the criteria? And if we don't, why don't we need it? And is the owner comfortable with that? And then if we don't have a criteria and we want a criteria, What's a reasonable criteria? So free body diagrams. This is going to be in a separate video. Um, I don't imagine you wanna jump in and do that right now. We'll record this. I'm assuming you would like to record this part maybe after the kids. Yeah, I think. Yeah, okay. So we're gonna actually post two videos today. I will post uh, a lecture one video part two. That is this section here. Dave hasn't seen me, so I'm going to show them to you quickly. Don't you look? Don't you look? You're supposed to be surprised by these. So just to kind of give you a teaser, these are some of the, the free body diagrams Dave is going to look at. Oh, I have that one twice. That's a mistake. And I do have another one I'm going to add. So you'll see another one for when Dave does it that's not in here. This one was a hard one to get. I did hurt myself. You have to be so close to make it go backwards and not be in the picture. So you don't have any assigned homework today. It's not assigned work. It's not home homework. But I think if you want to start getting comfortable with this, um, and you can just do it if you're walking down the street and your podcast isn't playing, uh, start looking around and thinking about this process. So look at a few static objects around you. What are the loads on them? Do you know what the loads should be? I haven't given you a lot of them yet, um, but what's reasonable? Is it something that maybe a person could climb? Uh, does it look like it could get snow on it? You don't have to know the values, but think about what it would be. Once you know what it is, we can define the values. Uh, what material should it be built out of? Or what material is it built out of? Is it a combination? Just because you see stone on something doesn't mean it's built out of stone. Is there something in behind it that's holding it up? What in your head do you think the free body diagram would look like? Uh, what do you think the connections look like? Be creepy a little bit, don't get in trouble, but go up and look at some of these things outside on the street and see what these connections look like. Uh, what serviceability limits do you think might have been used? And that doesn't mean, you know, it was allowed to move five millimeters. If it was made out of stone, we don't want the stone to crack or fall off of whatever its support is. So maybe they were worried about the stone. So its serviceability limits might have been similar to masonry. I'm not telling you to think about what the actual value is, but what thought process might have gone into those limits. And do you think vibration would have been a concern? 
So if somebody was sitting on this object and somebody jumped up and down beside them on it, would you care? Because um, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't care. There are certain times where vibration is really annoying to people and other times where you just accept that it's fine. If you're standing in the subway station and you feel the train go by, you don't care as much as if you were standing on a set of stairs and somebody ran up beside you and the stair vibrated. So think about whether somebody would care if there was vibration problems or, or the sensation of vibration on that object. If you want, draw some free body diagrams or draw the objects. If you want, this isn't a forced exercise at all, but if you want to, feel free to send them to us and we could add them in to the beginning of next week's lecture or add them to the slides of this um, uh, so people see reference to them. We could solve them for you uh, and answer them or hopefully even next week we could possibly do it in person. They didn't give me a list of anyone who was, I know I sent out a survey uh, for people who couldn't make it for the first few lectures. Um, I've been told that I don't have to meet that accommodation and I shouldn't meet that accommodation unless I'm officially told by the administration to meet that, um, uh, to meet that standard. So if you're one of those people that said you couldn't attend the lecture um, and it is because of a reason that the administration should know about, you should be communicating with them because I didn't get any um, mandatory accommodation online requirements for the first four weeks for anyone in this class. I also haven't gotten any communication, so maybe they just haven't sent out the emails and they just knew I was doing my lecture uh, recorded the first week. But if you're one of those people, tell them they need to send me that or at least communicate with me so I can ask uh, the administration. My guess is um, we'll do the second lecture online, um, but if if possible, Dave or I will be in that classroom once we have it. If we have no classroom, we have nowhere we can be. Um, so hopefully we have a classroom by next week um, and one of us will be downtown from nine to 12. And I think just out of courtesy, I would like to record the lecture next week. Um, I wanna be as accommodating to everyone as I possibly can. So I think for sure next week we'll record it and hopefully I can be sitting there uh, from nine to 12. I'll work, if no one shows up, no big deal. I'm happy to work for three hours um, because I'm essentially doubling down on my time here because um, I'm still recording the lecture, but then I'm still being there in person. So I'm giving up an extra solid chunk of time where I should be working. Um, but I think it's important for you guys to have access to us as well. Uh, so if you wanna come and don't have any questions, I'll just sit there working until someone comes and asks, asks a question, but you don't have to. So don't, don't hunt for questions uh, to come uh, ask me, just come if you, if you have something you need solved. Uh, so that's this part of the lecture. And then um, I'm gonna have this posted for you. So you should be watching this sometime uh, around nine o'clock. Uh, and hopefully by the time you're done this video, Dave's video will already be posted and you can jump in and uh, watch that part of it as well. It'll definitely be posted before 11 and it will be less than probably an hour, it'd be half an hour is my guess. Uh, and if we were there in person, Dave would have been doing this from 11 o'clock until probably 11.30. So we'll try to meet those time requirements. Um, again, I like things to be posted early. I would have even posted this yesterday, uh, but um, my kid's school bus didn't come for his very first day of school ever, which was kind of heartbreaking at daycare. And there was a few other kids. So we ended up um, being the bus for those kids to, we had permission from the parents and drove kids to school. Uh, but it ate up hours of the day. Um, so I didn't get to record this yesterday. So here it is today, live in time. And now it's slowly starting to get light. So for me, it's uh, just after six o'clock. Uh, it's so good to be talking to you guys again, and hopefully next week I'm seeing you guys in person.